Hello, welcome to Creative Writing Strategies Your Teen Will Love. I'm Jess Woods, and I'm currently a certified English teacher with Excelsior Classes, where I teach various literature and composition courses. Before becoming an online educator, I taught at a public high school for several years. And in addition to teaching, I'm also a published author, and I do a little bit of editing on the side. As you can probably tell from my career choices, reading and writing are important to me. I'm really excited to spend this time with you today because I believe that every person has a voice and a story or multiple stories. And I believe that getting comfortable with our voices and telling our stories is both therapeutic and affirming and can build confidence. The focus of our time together today will be to give you a baseline for getting your teenager interested in writing. Now, does this mean that your student will magically begin to love writing the moment you implement some or all of these strategies? No. Does it mean that your student will love writing across various genres? Not necessarily. The goal is simply to get your student writing to build confidence, and to expose your student to writing avenues they may not have explored before in a way they haven't explored before. In my experience, I run across four types of teenage writers, and perhaps your student falls into one of these categories. The first is the reluctant writer. This is a student who does not think he or she can write or who has no desire to write at all. The second is the inexperienced writer. This is a student who has the desire to write, but doesn't really know where to start or how to form pieces into what he or she envisions they want them to be. The third writer is the emerging writer. And this is a student who is comfortable writing and has some shining moments here and there, but needs overall instruction and exposure to really develop his or her, her skills. And then finally, we have the overzealous writer. And this is a student who thinks they've got it all figured out, but who hasn't really given enough thought and study to the craft. These are the students who come into my classes saying that maybe they've already written a book or even published a book. And while it is important not to discourage the enthusiasm, it's also important to make sure that these students understand that writing is an art and that it does take study, dedication, and a lot of revision to really make your piece into a polished piece. So maybe your student falls into one of these four categories, and the good news is that no matter where your student is, writing is for your student. Sometimes I find that students don't really have an understanding of what creative writing is, and that creates an obstacle. So it's important to be able to understand what it is. So, simply put, creative writing is writing that is not academic in nature. Academic writing would be things like scholarly journals, research papers, um, literary analysis, that sort of thing. Creative writing expresses ideas or emotions in a creative or artistic way. And one common misconception is that creative writing is always fiction, and it's not. Creative writing does not have to be fiction. So here are some examples, and perhaps you um, see an interest that your student would have here. So poetry, short stories, plays, movie and television scripts, songwriting, greeting cards, comic strips, game development. I'm sure that several of you have gamers out there and um, that storyline is part of creative writing, social media. And then we have a whole genre of creative nonfiction and we branch into things like creative journalism, memoirs, personal es essays, blogs, and even speeches. Here's a really quick overview of what we are going to look at today. I've tried to list these in sort of a hierarchy of sorts, meaning that if we start at one, which is reading, 
that's a great place for any teenager, regardless of their writing experience. Um, blogging, fan fiction, mixed media, those are wonderful entry points into creative writing. And then things like prompts, guides, and poetry are really good for honing in um, skills and producing growth. So this is a lot to cover. We're going to go kind of quick, but bear with me. The first thing is reading, and I don't know that you will find an author who does not think that reading is an essential part of the craft. Victor Hugo, who wrote Les Miserables, says to learn to read is to light a fire. Every syllable that is spelled out is a spark. Why is it important? Why do so many writers stand on the fact that reading is the foundation of the craft? Um, simply put, it teaches us. So we learn things like grammar, syntax, dialogue, plot, characterization, all of that through reading. We learn vocabulary through reading. We gain inspiration through reading. It helps writers see as a reader does. So if you're reading a story and you pick up on some pet peeves or you see holes um, or you see a sentence that is structured poorly, those things kind of internally get inside your mind and it really does help you to grow your craft overall. Reading also exposes writers to different genres and different experiences. And whether your student is going to be writing um, post-secondary school or not, whether this is a real interest or not, uh, reading helps to build empathy and that's important. It gives us access to experiences we wouldn't always have otherwise. So this is why reading is a foundation and why it's so important because you absolutely cannot be a writer without first being a reader. So that's a good starting place. The second thing is blogging and this is a really good starting place too. Now hear me out because I know this one sounds a little bit strange but in my creative writing classes, we always start with blogging because of how easy of a launch point it is. And here's why. Blogging allows students to write about things that interest them. So it, it's not just like, okay, you need to go write a poem or you need to do this. This is literally you have control and you write about what is interesting you. Um, it also builds confidence. It's good practice. Any type of writing, honestly, is good practice. And it doesn't necessarily feel like writing. Um, because your student is not going to be a professional blogger, they don't have to post every day. They don't have to kind of keep up with a blogosphere. It can just be completely undaunting. Some platforms that you might consider if you're going to go this route are WordPress, Blogger, Tumblr, Medium, Wix and Kids World. Kids World is, I don't have a lot of experience with this, but um, it's supposed to be for users who are 13 and under. Obviously, anything you do on the internet, you're going to want to um, monitor that for your child. WordPress is probably the most popular, but WordPress and Blogger and Tumblr are all kind of ready-made. You don't have to know coding um, and there are templates and so these are easy platforms to start out. Here are a few things that some of my previous students have said. I just want you to kind of hear that so that you can have an idea of why blogging might have a place in creative writing and why it might be a strategy you would like to use. These are all from students who were previously not writers. One student said, I never knew I could enjoy writing so much. That's positive. Another said, blogging has opened my eyes to a new passion. And then this is probably my favorite feedback from the whole blogging experience that I've had as a teacher. I continued my blog outside of class and have been able to encourage many chronically ill teens as a result. We've built a kind of community of support. It's great. So blogging is a great place to start if you have a reluctant writer. Moving on to number three. Fan fiction is also a wonderful entry point into writing. You may be asking what fan fiction is. Fan fiction has been around as long as storytelling has been around. So if you go back to mythology, lore, um, any of that sort of stuff, you're going to see that there are variations. There are sometimes different endings for different folklores and myths and that sort of thing. And that's kind of where fan fiction started. But I would say about two decades ago, the digital age catapulted fan fiction into what it is now. 
it can be a great launch point for young writers, and here's why. Fan fiction allows writers and readers to ask speculative questions and reflect on what comes next. So if you have a, um, a student who is really into Harry Potter or The Hunger Games or even a TV series that, that is not a book in any capacity, um, you already have interest invested with that student. So if they are allowed to speculate um, or if they don't like the way the series ended or they don't like what happened to a particular character, they can write an alternate ending or an alternate scene. Um, and so that's part of why fan fiction is so popular. It also allows writers and readers to stay immersed in a series or a story long after they've watched it or read it. Uh, maybe you have a child who's really into Star Wars or Avengers or, you know, anything like that. And they sit down at the dinner table and they talk about it, right? Um, or fan theories or, or like whatever. Um, this is part of why fan fiction is a big deal. Another positive to fan fiction is you can find and build community through fan fiction. As with any writing, any writing is good practice. And this is, you know, thinking far into the future, but authors actually can make a living off of fan fiction. I have a couple of friends who make between fifty and eighty thousand dollars a year writing fan fiction. Um, one of them writes Jane Austen variations, and that's what she does for a living. So. Um, one word of caution, fanfic websites and platforms definitely should be supervised because there can be some inappropriate content. I know that as parents, you probably already know that, but I just feel like I couldn't get away without saying that. So fan fiction is an awesome entry point into writing, but do be careful with those websites and platforms. Ann Jameson, who wrote a piece called Why Fan Fiction is Taking Over the World, says this about it. Irritated fans produce fanfic like irritated oysters produce pearls. Um, so again, this is a great place to start if you have a child who is maybe a little reluctant to write. Another great strategy for reluctant writers is mixed media. Now mixed media is typically identified with the art world because you have things like oil pastels and charcoal and watercolors and that sort of thing, but uh, it is becoming increasingly popular in the creative writing world thanks to social media platforms like Instagram and Twitter, um, particularly Instagram, and thanks to the success of bullet journaling, scrapbooking, etc. I don't know if any of your kids bullet journal, but like I love bullet journaling. I like doodling and putting my stickers on. It just makes my week feel nice and neat. So your student might be pretty artistic and like to kind of combine different venues of art. Mixed media is creative, immersive, and flexible, and generally it's not quite as daunting as saying, go write me a poem. Here are the benefits. Mixed media allows students who are strong in other creative areas to branch into writing gradually. It also shows students how the arts can work together, and it stretches students creatively and cognitively. Here are just a few examples. Creative journaling, and this is a picture of creative journaling over here. You see there's a photograph, um, a little clipping from a newspaper, and then there are so, there's some writing, and there are these little um, background, maybe cardstock or wallpaper images. I don't know what it is. Um, but if you were to look, that's it's going to kind of look collage-like. It's going to look like a collection of things. So creative journaling is certainly an example of mixed media. Bullet journaling um, is part of creative journaling as well. If you have a student who loves photography, a photo blog could be a really um, great um, way to launch them into writing. Um, they could take pictures and they could just give a little blurb about the picture. Then they could tell what kind of camera they used and lens and exposure and all that stuff. So that's definitely a thing. Art journaling and then songwriting. So really just seeing how the arts all can work together takes away some of that intimidation from the writing um, sphere and allows students to embrace the creative side. 
Okay, now let's move on to a different set of writing strategies. Now these can be good for levels uh, all across the board, whether they're reluctant or emergent or whatever, but generally um, prompts are gonna be for students who are maybe a little more ready to write or a little less reluctant, all right? So the purpose is um, to fight writer's block a lot of times students will sit down and, and they might want to write but they just they can't think of an idea or they're frustrated because their ideas aren't coming to them so prompts are a great way to get past that uh, it also gives students a space for writing without requiring them to think of a topic so instead they're just thinking of how they're going to present it all right there are three main benefits to prompts the first is that writers generally have an opinion or an idea while reading prompts. And not every prompt is gonna resonate with a student, but generally you read it and you, you kind of have a spark of an idea or you have an opinion that you could elaborate on. The second benefit is that there are literally thousands available for free online. So everything that we've talked about so far has been free. This is just another free resource. And the third benefit is that a prompt can be a peer or a group activity. One of my favorite things to do in creative writing is to take a prompt and give it to my students and then see what direction they all take it because generally it's vastly different and they're a little bit surprised too. Well, oh, I interpreted it this way or I went this way with it. Uh, so it's really interesting to kind of see how those prompts play out. If you have not had much experience with prompts, I wanted to give you a couple of examples here, and these are just pulled from Google very quickly. There are so many websites, but I chose um, thinkwritten.com and writtenwordmedia.com. So um, here's an example of an eavesdropper prompt. Create a poem, a short story, or a journal entry about a conversation that you've overheard. This isn't too different from what we might do around the dinner table or while we're out on a walk. If you are in the supermarket or you're at the park and you overhear something that you thought was funny or interesting, you might tell it to someone else, right? So um, just kind of writing that down. An addict prompt is kind of interesting. Everyone's addicted to something in some shape or form. What are things you can't go without? This can just be a basic response, or maybe they turn it into an ode to something that they feel like they can't go without, like technology or gaming or sweet tea, whatever it is. Um, the dictionary definition one is really fun. Open up a dictionary to a random word. Define what that word means to you. So it causes students to think a little bit, but they're not having to necessarily come up with a topic. Or we can skip down to these that are a little more creative. When people are born, they are signed a soulmate. They have a song in their head, and uh, only them and their soulmate know it. How do you find your soulmate? Or this one. Write a story about a character waking up to something absurd. Um, or this, this is a good one. Write a short story with an unreliable narrator that readers can never quite trust. Um, the unreliable narrator has gained a lot of popularity in recent years, too. If you're fami familiar with the stories of Edgar Allan Poe, I think he probably was the master of the unreliable narrator. But certainly, it's really interesting to kind of get in the head of that unreliable narrator. Um, and students can take this any kind of way they want. So prompts are really good to just get students writing to help them get past the hurdle of thinking up a topic. And again, thousands of these available for free online. Moving on, let's talk about guides and I've broken this up into three different kinds of guides the first is class um, classes are a great resource generally you're not going to find these for free you do have to pay for them um, but the benefits are you have guidance by a professional and you do always want to check out who the teacher is and what their credentials are um, if they're credible that sort of thing but generally a class is going to be um, given by a professional and so that guidance will be good. It provides accountability. It also provides feedback. So you'll, you know, in a situation like this, your student will get feedback on what's being done well, what needs improvement, what's working, what's not working. I do think classes tend to build confidence and stretch students out of their comfort zones a little bit. It exposes them to new genres and styles, things that they wouldn't maybe have done on their own. 
uh, classes have the potential for peer review. I can't speak for all creative writing classes because I haven't been in all creative writing classes, but generally creative writing classes are going to have that peer review component that I think is invaluable to writing. And they can build community. So it's a lot of really good, solid benefits. I'm going to show you some examples of what a class can offer in just a little bit, but I want to move on to the other two before I do that. Another type of guide would be a book. Um, books are generally pretty cheap, so while you are looking at a bit of an investment here, it's not much. There are a ton of options available for creative writing books. These can be done independently or in a group, so that's a benefit to some people. Uh, I do think books are also good at giving guidance and inspiration. Obviously, not all books are going to be um, you know, top notch, but I particularly like the Boris Fishman series. Um, and if you are a participant you in this today, you are going to have a chance to win one of my favorite Boris Fishman books. So that's definitely one route that you might want to look at. And then the last type of guide that I think is beneficial would be clubs or groups. Clubs and groups also provide accountability. They may provide feedback depending on how they're set up. They also build community. Clubs and groups can be done virtually or in person, and that's a real benefit depending on where you are. And I think they also build confidence. So these guides I think are really important, um, really for anyone. If you have a reluctant writer, I think that this could work. If you have an emergent writer, definitely could work. Um, an inexperienced writer, and even an overzealous writer, they could all benefit from classes, books, clubs, or groups. Let's take a moment to look at classes in a little more detail. Now, Again, this is from my class because it's what I have the most familiarity with. I can't speak for all creative writing classes, but I, I think that there are some commonalities that you might be able to find in them. You would just have to reach out to specific teachers or organizations. So classes are really good for building community, discussion, and feedback, and I think all of those things build confidence overall. So you'll see that this is a, an example of a blog up here. The student can't do a whole lot because it's within our learning management system, but there's a, a banner that she's created and kind of has the same sort of theme. There's a little bit of about me. Um, if you were to look on these sides here, these would be her weekly blogs and they can be, if you look at this little chat icon, you'll see that there are nine different comments. So there's definitely interaction going on. This is the first thing we do in my creative writing classes because it is a nice launch point into writing. It gets the students familiar with one another. They get to know each other um, and then their confidence is able to grow through that experience. So that's one thing. Um, I think classes also give you a really great opportunity to have some good discussion around writing and around what's going on in the writing world. So in this particular discussion, they have been assigned um, an article called The Truth About Memoirs. It talks about blurring the line between fact and fiction and if that's really an issue or not. So students read the article and then they discuss. Do you agree with this article? Do you not? Um, and you'll see that they they definitely talk to one another there. And then the last thing is feedback. Um, this is a short story you'll see here and I'm not going to read it to you. Um, I've given a little bit of constructive criticism, something that the student might want to think about because the reader might pause on that for a moment. It's not quite believable. Um, and then there's some feedback on what's done well and what could be improved. So I think that that classes work really well. Um, here is something that a parent said. This class really stretched his writing in a good way. I will never forget the excited way he called me in to say he had written a poem. Um, poetry, again, seems to be pretty daunting for a lot of students, so this is a big deal. And then from a student, Mrs. Woods taught writing in a way that made the work enjoyable. Before we started some of the projects or sections, I thought I was not going to like them very much, so this is those strategies to stretch students out, right? But Mrs. Woods really invested in us a love for writing. I've grown so much as a writer. You're not going to just get this kind of experience from a class. Um, any kind of strategy that you incorporate, I think, can stretch students out of their comfort zones and get them writing and get their confidence built. But I wanted to at least let you kind of inside a classroom for a moment so you could kind of see what that might look like. Okay, and now our last strategy is probably the most daunting one of all, and it's our poetry strategy. 
I do save poetry in my classes for a little bit later in the semester just because it inevitably is going to produce a little bit of fear and anxiety in students and I think it's because students don't completely understand poetry and what it is. So let's talk about what poetry is very quickly. Poetry is writing that specifically focuses on feeling, emotion, and experience or experience. It gives more focus to literary devices and sound devices. So poetry tends to be a little more lyrical. It doesn't sound as conversational. It doesn't sound like prose. It's not like you're just picking up a novel and reading it. It's going to sound different and it's certainly going to look different than prose as well. I often get asked, well, what counts as poetry? Does it have to rhyme? Does it have to have a specific meter? And the answer to that is no. Anything counts as poetry, sort of. But the more a student gets familiar with poetry and reads poetry, is exposed to poetry and practices poetry, the more they'll be able to identify, is this poetry or is this just someone who threw words on a page and didn't give it much thought or intention, all right? So that is kind of the basics of poetry. All right, here are the benefits of poetry. Poetry can actually be very therapeutic. Um, I've had several students tell me after the poetry section, man, I just, I didn't realize that I could kind of unpack my emotions with this image. And um, it, it's just, it ha has the tendency to be kind of healing. So that's good. It forces reflection and it forces intentionality. You're not just going to be able to spout off anything that you think of. You have to be intentional with your words because you have limited space in a poem, whereas in a novel you wouldn't have, or even in a blog entry, you wouldn't have um, as many restrictions. So you have to be very intentional with your words, with your imagery, with your literary devices, that sort of thing. Poetry also gets students out of their comfort zones, and I love that because once a student can stretch outside of their comfort zone and they accomplish something, their confidence is going to grow and they'll be more willing to write something else in the future. Poetry is also timeless and it's, irrelevant, it's relevant across all cultures. Um, and it's also the foundation of songwriting. So if you have a student that's really into music or songwriting, poetry is going to be a great place for that student. So how do you implement poetry? And there are several ways that I think work. The first is through prompts. There are specific poetry prompts that you can find and Google will pull up a, a ton of those as well. If there's a poet that you like, say you want to emulate Frost or E. Cummings or Emily Dickinson, or you wanna make it really simple and look at something like Dr. Seuss or Shel Silverstein, you could emulate a specific poet. You could try your hand at a specific type of poem. Maybe you want to write a haiku or a sonnet or a ballad. You could do that. Or if you want to start really easy in something that's kind of not as daunting, you could try Insta poetry, which became famous on Instagram and Twitter, or micro poetry. And Ruby Carr is um, probably the most famous micro poet at this point, or Insta poet at this point. She's done really well for herself. Um, you can see it's just really short and simple, and really doesn't sound a whole lot different than just a status update, right? So. There is debate within the writing world whether Insta poetry is poetry or not. I tend to think that it's great. So you're taking those words, you're consolidating, you're being intentional, um, so it works. So that's how you could implement poetry. Here are some types of poetry if you want um, an idea on what's easier or more difficult. Things like haikus, limericks, free verse, narrative, and pastorals, I think are gonna be easier to implement overall. And things like sonnet, blank verse, villanelles, and vowels will be more difficult because you do have to pay attention to either meter or rhyme scheme or you know specific line count, that sort of thing. Um, but you certainly could look into any of these and there are all kinds of cool things you can do with some of these easier ones like haikus and limericks. They're um, a little less intimidating. All right, so those are the strategies that I think that you can implement or look at implementing for your student. I want to end today by giving you some quotations from some famous authors that I 
thought were pretty timely and fit in with the content for today. Octavia Butler, who is a famous, or she was a famous sci-fi author, says, you don't start out writing good stuff. And sometimes I think students need to hear that. They're scared to even try because it's not going to be good enough. But she says, you start out writing crap and think it's good stuff and then gradually you get better at it. That's why I say one of the most valuable traits is persistence. Just keep at it. Sylvia Plath, famous poet, said, and by the way, everything in life is writable about if you have the outgoing guts to do it and the imagination to improvise. The worst enemy to creativity is self-doubt. And we kind of get through self-doubt by persisting and trying new things and gaining confidence, right? Louis Lamar said, start writing no matter what. The water does not flow until the faucet is turned on. And then Anne Frank said, I can shake off everything as I write. My sorrows disappear. My courage is reborn. So that's kind of that therapeutic um, look into writing as well. I hope you've enjoyed this and gotten some great ideas for how you can um, implement writing for your teenager. I also wanted to give you guys my contact information just in case you have other questions. Maybe I didn't address here or you, you want to ask a follow-up question. You can contact me through my teaching information at Excelsior Classes. I'm not going to read that for you, but it's right there. Um, or through my author contact information, and you'll see that on the other side of the screen. Thanks so much for joining with me today. Happy writing.